Every April, a group of scientists observes the faint glow of asteroids passing by our planet. One year, they realized there was something weird shimmering in their telescopes. The team expected it to be another asteroid. But they ended up very surprised, because what they discovered was an unusual space rock that didn't consist of the minerals that usually make up asteroids. It was made of silicon, the material mostly found on the moon. They named it Kamo Oaliwa, which is a Hawaiian word that means wobbling celestial object. The rock didn't match any near-Earth asteroid scientists had already been familiar with. Instead, that piece had a pattern of reflected light similar to that of the moon rocks astronauts had brought back from NASA missions. This fragment turned out to be a quasi-satellite, which is a kind of asteroids that orbit both our planet and the Sun. It repeatedly circles Earth and has a quite unusual tilt. That's the reason you can only see it in the night sky once a year. The fragment is pretty shy, too. Aw, it never gets closer to our planet than 9 million miles. That's almost 40 times as far away as the moon. Plus, this space body often hides in the shadows. Scientists have figured out the piece won't stay in this orbit for a long time. It probably arrived at its current position about 500 years ago. And its orbit is likely to change in the next 300 years. This fragment may not be alone out there in space. Mm -mm. There are at least three more similar near-Earth objects. They may have all come from the same place. Researchers aren't sure yet about the nature of the rock, but they can find out more about this unusual space object if they send a spacecraft to collect samples and bring them to Earth. That's something China's space agency is planning to do later this decade. Now, the moon appeared in the middle of chaos. There are several theories about how that happened. The first one claims the moon used to be just a wandering body, similar to an asteroid. It formed somewhere in our solar system. Once, it approached too close to Earth and got captured by our planet's gravity. The second theory says that our planet was spinning so quickly that some material broke off and started circling around it. One of the largest pieces was the moon. The third theory says that the Moon was formed at a time when our planet was going through its own formation process. But today, the most widely accepted theory goes like this. Once, a long, long time ago, but not in a galaxy far, far away. Earth collided with a Mars-sized planet. The debris and clouds of dust from the collision gathered around our planet and started circling it. Eventually, something that we today know as the Moon formed there. Apollo missions brought more than a third of a ton of soil and rock from the lunar surface. These rocks show that the Moon had mostly the same building materials as our planet. This might mean they have a common history. If the Moon had been formed somewhere else and had been eventually captured by the gravitational force of our planet, it would have a different composition. Also, if it had been created at the same time as our planet or had once broken off, there would be the same minerals on both the Moon and Earth. But the minerals on the Moon contain less water. Plus, our planet's natural satellite is rich in materials that form fast at high temperatures. Now, the Moon isn't the only space body in the solar system with a mysterious past. Hippocamp is Neptune's moon, discovered in 2013. It's the smallest moon of this ice giant, a mere 21 miles across. It's very close to Proteus, the biggest of Neptune's inner moons. And no, Hippocamp is not a place for big African mammals to spend the summer. Scientists think Hippocamp probably formed from debris after Proteus collided with a comet. If Hippocamp had entered Proteus's orbit from some other place in our solar system, the bigger moon would have either swallowed it or booted the tiny moon away. But not even Proteus itself is among the first generation of Neptune's moons. It was formed from the remains of the planet's earliest system of moons. Those first moons were destroyed when Neptune captured Triton, currently the largest of its moons. The main evidence proving the collision was likely to happen is the fact that Triton circles around Neptune backward, unlike other moons orbiting the planet. Neptune captured Triton from the Kuiper Belt. That's an area filled with icy objects and rocky debris stretching beyond Uranus. That means Hippocamp is a third-generation moon, kind of like a second cousin twice removed or something. Now the Sun also had a turbulent past. Our star appeared about 4.6 billion years ago. It's hard to study its early stages of life since that happened 50 million years before our planet was even formed. But recently, a team of researchers has discovered crystals that are over 4.5 billion years old. 
hidden deep within meteorites, they've revealed some things about the past of our Sun. Before the planets were formed, our solar system had consisted of a central star and a massive disk of dust and hot gas spiraling around it. As the dust and gases cooled down, they turned into minerals, including the crystals found in the meteorites that landed on our planet. Those ancient materials were irradiated, unlike some younger substances. Researchers think something might have happened to the Sun after those crystals were formed. Perhaps the activity of our star was less intense then. Or maybe, for some reason, these younger materials couldn't travel to the areas where irradiation was possible. Dwarf planets give us a chance to sneak a peek into the ancient years of the solar system. Around 4 billion years ago, Jupiter's, Saturn's, and Neptune's gravitational forces joined. They sent asteroids and comets hurtling across the solar system, making them collide with different planets. All the dwarf planets from the Kuiper Belt, for example Pluto, Eris, Haumea, Makemake, have their own moons that likely formed after some powerful collisions. Icy debris in orbits similar to Haumea's, for example, can prove the theory of an ancient collision. The debris it created simply didn't have enough energy to float away from the dwarf planet's gravitational pull. Ceres, another dwarf planet, has ammonia-rich clays on its surface. Ammonia isn't stable at the temperatures prevailing on Ceres. But there's plenty of this substance in the outer solar system. It means that Ceres was probably formed in those outer parts and got kicked inward. After all, the gas giants were migrating a lot at those early stages of the solar system. Or the dwarf planet could have formed in an asteroid belt, and ammonia somehow, let's say after a powerful impact, appeared on the dwarf planet. Ceres might help scientists understand icy moons better. The ocean floor on Earth has a high concentration of carbonate minerals, and some parts of Ceres have them too. This means this dwarf planet is like some sort of fossilized ocean world. Many exoplanets, a term used for planets outside the solar system, have also gone through pretty intense collisions in their early stages. This double star system is more than 300 light years away from us, and its stars are at least 1 billion years old. Even though it's not young, this system still shows some signs of swirling clouds of dusty debris that haven't cooled down yet, which isn't something you'd expect from a star system of this age. This debris is still warm. It means there might have been a strong collision of two planets or some other space bodies of similar size in that region and relatively recently. So hey, everybody just simmer down. Dust particles circle around a young star. They stick together and grow bigger with time. That's how planets form. The leftover dust often settles in some distant cold areas. An example in our solar system is the Kuiper Belt. It's located far away beyond Neptune. As solar systems evolve, those particles keep colliding until they're so small they end up being pulled into nearby stars or kicked out of the system. Uranus spins on its side if you compare it with the rest of the planets in our solar system. And the only way we can explain it is a powerful collision in the past. Something much bigger than a regular comet or some other space body of similar size likely hit Uranus and knocked the planet on the side. It was probably a planet twice the size of Earth. It could be a protoplanet. This is a space body made up mostly of ice and rock that orbits a star and is likely to develop into a planet sometime in the future. Anyway, the fallout from the impact smothered the core of Uranus. It prevented the heat inside the planet from escaping. This might explain why Uranus has extremely cold temperatures on its surface. <laughs> Man, bring a jacket and a blanket. Wow, the NASA hotline is ringing off the hook. The call center operator is all sweaty from stress. They barely have time to answer the phone, and all the messages they get say the same thing. There's something glowing on the moon. Indeed, hundreds and thousands of amateur astronomers were watching the moon that night. And suddenly, there was a bright light on it, as if someone had lit a powerful spotlight on the surface. Scientists immediately began to look for an explanation to this phenomenon. They first thought it was simply the glow of an airplane flying between the observers and the moon. But then it wouldn't have been seen by so many people from different parts of the world at the same time. The next suspects were the Starlink satellites. Theoretically, one of them could have played a cruel trick on amateur astronomers. They could have mistaken the small satellite's light for a flash of light on the moon. But then again, if the satellite were the culprit of this mess, the flare wouldn't be static, but moving. 
While some scientists continue to search for an answer to this mystery, others decide to investigate the phenomenon in more detail. For this purpose, they have built a new telescope north of Seville, Spain. The conditions there are quite suitable for observing the moon. The telescope has two cameras, controlled remotely from the campus in Germany. If both cameras pick up any unusual phenomenon on the surface of the moon, it will quickly zoom the telescope there to see what's going on. It'll also require advanced artificial intelligence to teach the cameras to distinguish between the unexplained phenomenon on the moon and the light of an airplane, a satellite, or a small meteorite that just entered the Earth's atmosphere. While the telescope is doing its investigation, we already have a theory that may explain the appearance of such bright round flashes on the moon's surface. So, the moon influences the tides of the seas and oceans on Earth with its gravitational force. But the Earth can affect the moon in the same way. Only the force will be 32 and a half times stronger. While the moon orbits the Earth, at one point, it may be as close to our planet as possible. Then the force of the interaction will be greatest. At this point, tidal forces may force cracks in the surface of the moon to open and release gas from its interior. A powerful jet of gas will lift the lunar dust with it. And what we see as a bright flash through our telescopes is really just a fog of dust, which is round and reflects sunlight well. If you look at it from a distance, it really does look like a flash. As the dust rises, we think there's been a small explosion. And that flash gradually fades as the dust settles down. These things happen all the time on the moon's surface. They're called transient lunar phenomena. And besides lunar flashes, much more mystical and bizarre things have happened. Back in 1178, five monks claimed to have seen the moon being in the shape of a horn begin to split in two from an upper point. Then fire and sparks began to blaze from the place of separation. It was as if a dragon were spewing flames. In the next moment, the moon began to pulsate and then returned to its calm state. This phenomenon was repeated more than 10 times, and the flames took different shapes each time. When this nightmare was over, the moon turned black. It wasn't until the 20th century that scientists tried to explain the phenomenon. They theorized that a large asteroid collided with the moon at the time. And it was this asteroid that should be blamed for creating the Giordano Bruno crater, 15 Brooklyn bridges wide. But in that case, millions of tons of fragments from the asteroid would have hit the Earth as well. And then, people would have seen an incredible meteor shower. It would have been very bright, and the memories of it would definitely have been in the archives. But that didn't happen. Now, the phenomenon the monks observed seems questionable. Perhaps they did see an asteroid fall, only it was falling on the Earth itself, and they perceived the light from the burning meteorite as something sinister happening on the moon. Or maybe the monks were simply imagining things. There's no witnesses to this event other than them. Another unusual phenomenon is the blue and red lights on the moon. They can be seen when it's horn-shaped. And this occurs most often in the Aristarchus crater. The flashes come and go very quickly, almost like lightning. In fact, this is electricity. Tidal forces are to blame for this too. They cause mechanical stress to build up in the rocks. This can produce an electric field, which creates the blue flashes that have surprised many amateur astronomers. There can also be starbursts on the moon. We can blame this on meteorites that fall on the surface. Because the moon has no atmosphere, asteroids that approach it don't burn up. Having a lot of weight and speed, they cause an explosion on impact. And here on Earth, we see it as a starburst. For example, on May 13, 1972, there was a meteorite impact of 1,000 tons of TNT near where Apollo 14 landed. If we live much earlier, we might have witnessed constant bright flashes on the moon's surface. All the craters there are formed by such meteor strikes. So imagine the fireworks that were there years ago. And a lot of those meteorites were even useful too. They brought water with them. Yes, there is water on the moon. 
NASA confirmed this fact after studies with the SOFIA telescope. It was mounted on an airplane. The observations were made from the upper atmosphere of the Earth. At such an altitude, the dry air allowed the telescope to see even the smallest details. Water might have been in the craters at the poles of the moon. These places have never seen light, and the water there might be encased in ice. But Sophia found water on the sunlit surface of the moon. Of course, it's only H2O molecules that are present in the dust layers. But that's something. If we manage to collect all this water, we'll get very little of it. In comparison, the Sahara Desert has about 100 times more water than we found on the moon. But an even more unusual phenomenon is happening there right now. The moon is actually rusting, just like a piece of old metal. For rust to appear, we need iron, water, and oxygen. Lunar soil has enough iron in it, and as we've already learned, there's some water too. The last piece of the puzzle is oxygen. Everyone knows there's no atmosphere on the moon, and we can't breathe there. But oxygen is still present. The solar wind brought it there. The wind from our warm star moves at an extremely high speed. It scrapes oxygen from the upper parts of our atmosphere and carries it further through space. Eventually, the wind with the oxygen molecules reaches the moon. Voila! All the ingredients for corrosion are in place and the iron ore on the surface of the moon begins to take on a reddish hue. If this process goes on long enough, in the distant future, the moon will look like Mars. It will turn orange-red. Yes, the signature color of Mars came exactly from that corrosion that began there thousands and thousands of years ago, when there were rivers and seas with water and an atmosphere with oxygen. Other strange objects that can be seen on the moon were left there by humans. Between 1969 and 1972, 12 people visited there as part of the Apollo program. In all, there were six landing sites where the astronauts left a bunch of stuff behind. Besides a couple of dozen satellites and spacecraft that fell or landed softly on the moon, there's a lunar rover, some United States flags, a family photo of one of the astronauts, and even three golf balls. And the first two people to be on the moon left behind a whole pile of stuff. When they were about to go home, they took a lot of soil samples and rocks with them. And to carry it all away, they had to get rid of everything unnecessary on board the lunar module. The TV camera, the sample collection tools, the science equipment, and even the armrests from the seats. The astronauts stood outside the lunar module for a full 8 minutes and threw out a whole mountain of unnecessary items. If you collect all these objects and debris that we left there by 12 astronauts and put them on the scales, it will show about 199 tons. It's like three heavy armored tanks or three large passenger planes. Strange, but true. You're on a plane heading to an important astronomy convention when you see a large figure outside your window that eclipses the whole sun. You spit out all of your coffee, and everyone in the plane stares outside in shock. You then notice that it has rings like Saturn. You were supposed to fly to Japan, but you're forced to land in California. As soon as you land, you look up in the sky and see some more giant planet-like structures floating around in the sky. Everyone is taking pictures and trying to figure out what's going on. Suddenly, you notice a huge ball of fire crashing down near the airport. Everyone scrambles for safety, and luckily, it ends up in the middle of the runway with no one around. The bad news is, there's no more runway for planes to land. Everyone huddles together for safety, and more large objects appear in the sky. All communications have ceased or broken down since these large objects have ruined all the satellites. Some scientists nearby mention that these objects are the planets of the solar system going within the same proximity as our moon. Mercury and Venus look like moons, but Saturn is occupying a lot of sky real estate. You tell those scientists that you're an astronomer. They invite you to join them on a trip to Antarctica to the observatory station in the South Pole. They need every mind to help solve this mystery. You get on a ship with the coordinates set to Antarctica. 
The waves are extremely rough for typical daylight and non-stormy weather. You finally make it to the shore of the continent after a few days and have to get in a snowmobile all the way to Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. Over here, you and a group of scientists will figure out what's going on. You weren't prepared for the freezing temperatures, even though it's July. You arrive at the station and see all your fellow scientists running around with paperwork and blurting out stuff about planets orbiting our atmosphere. You arrive at the conference room where the lead scientist explains what's going on. One by one, the planets are coming closer to us until they're aligned with the moon, but they still don't know why and how. Venus arrived first, and now Saturn is getting closer. The moon is around 240,000 miles away from Earth, and it affects the tides of the oceans and seas with its gravitational pull. Since water is less dense than land, we can see the tides change. So high tides occur when the Earth is pulled towards the moon. And since the other planets are coming closer to Earth, the gravitational pull is erratically changing. In a couple of hours, Saturn will be in the same distance as our moon. You head to the large telescope and observe the planets. Any plane or helicopter won't fly properly and won't have the proper radar technology to help it. You keep observing and notice Mars getting closer to Earth. You get news that tidal waves are rising very often now, and some island nations are even being washed away. Good thing they got evacuated beforehand. With Mars closing in, you notice Neptune also getting closer. You can feel the gravity on Earth fluctuate with every step you take. You report your findings to the lead scientist, and the only way for survival is to quickly build bunkers far away from oceans and seas that can host many people before the other planets close in. A team of engineers arrive and start building. Wave after wave of survivors come and settle into the bunkers, practically built overnight. With every hour, more planets are getting closer. Mars and Neptune have already settled in with Mercury, Venus, and Saturn. Pluto and Uranus are now visible to the unaided eye and are making their way towards Earth. The gravitational pull is getting completely out of hand. The snow in the Antarctic desert remains floating for several seconds whenever someone walks on it. You can jump a lot higher. It's now nighttime, but the sky isn't dark as usual. The planets are reflecting a lot more sunlight than our moon. It's barely visible now. With more observations, you notice comets and meteorites flying very close to our atmosphere. Some are even crashing down on Mars and Neptune. Everyone can see it from Earth. Other space debris also finds its way into Earth's atmosphere. But you notice something strange. The planets are now orbiting Saturn. You check your calculations and find out that the planet's positions are now aligned with Saturn's orbit. That's because it has the biggest mass among all the planets. Saturn's rings are made up of ice particles, some as large as a bus and others as tiny as pebbles. But they're all crashing and interfering with the other planets. No one can feel the orbit shift at first, but later you can start to feel it. With this happening, earthquakes and volcanoes are bound to happen. This is why everyone, including yourself, is packing up and ready to flee. Antarctica has dozens of volcanoes hidden beneath the frozen ice. Some are underground, while some are right on top. Saturn's gravitational pull is much stronger than Earth's gravitational pull on the moon. This will cause the inner core to react a lot more and kickstart those earthquakes and volcano eruptions. Everyone packs up super quick and heads to the choppers to fly to South Africa. These choppers were designed to have a direct course without the need for radars to guide them. You arrive in South Africa, which is mainly covered in water. The chopper takes you closer to the center, and then you travel to the Sahara Desert. The plain surface with nothing around it will be the best option for safety. But you look up in the sky and see another planet closing in. It's Jupiter, the biggest planet in our solar system. If Earth were the size of a grape, then Jupiter would be the size of a basketball. It's approaching quickly. Many of the other planets automatically make way for it, including Saturn. You're on the road heading to the Sahara, even though it'll take days to reach by car. The sky is dark during the day, since most planets are blocking the sun. You finally make it to the Sahara Desert with other scientists. 
and to your surprise, a whole city was erected in just a month when the planets started showing up. You settle in your dorm, but still have a lot of work to do. A couple of days later, Jupiter breaches the atmosphere and completely eclipses us. But Earth is now rotating around it. And it's much quicker than orbiting the Sun, since Jupiter is smaller. But since Saturn is also big, Earth keeps getting tossed from orbit to orbit, like two people playing a ball game with each other. So with that happening, people on Earth are experiencing different gravitational pulls from time to time. The tidal waves keep getting stronger, and volcanoes are erupting everywhere. Since the Earth's core is getting hotter, the temperature on Earth is also changing. And with a lack of sunlight most of the time, much of the plant life is having a hard time trying to keep up. Crops are harder to plant with natural sunlight, so people are turning to artificial lighting and greenhouses. Air and space travel are impossible. The International Space Station is completely ruined, along with the satellites orbiting space. That's why cell phones and the internet can't work. Gravity is even more dysfunctional than ever. Six months later, humanity has found some way of coping with the new normal, but things are constantly being updated. The number of hours in a day has changed, as well as days that compose a week. This used to be measured with the moon phases. A month used to be the moon achieving all phases from none to full moon, and so on. But Earth's moon has disappeared with the cluttered, disorganized planets.